This Debaku University video is for those growers considering flipping the switch and converting from HPS or high pressure sodium lights to LED lights. I'm going to walk you through some of the changes you're going to have to consider uh, which you might want to know ahead of time before simply just changing out the fixtures. All right, so the information for this presentation is based off the Gavita guide uh, provided. There is a downloadable paper, and there's also, they did a webinar. Hawthorne did a webinar uh, on YouTube with the link provided here, uh, the transcripts, uh, some information. But to just go over some of those uh, ideas or tips when you're looking at making this transition from an HPS lighting to an LED lighting setup. So things we want to keep in mind. So this is this form of a lighting manufacturer that sells both HBS and LED lights. They said we're looking at competing um, Gavita structures here. But it is providing information to help growers make the switch. They want you to be successful if you are going to be making that change. But this is based off the papers and the webinar based on the same company. Gavita has been known to uh, be a top producer of HPS lights. So seeing them make the transition uh, tip sheet is an indication that the advancement of their LED light technology is here uh, to there where there could be, as you're saying here, a potential for a one-to-one -one replacement. We have to look beyond the fixtures. So first off, what are we going to be comparing? We're going to be looking at, well, this is the uh, Gavita SL2. It's a thousand watt uh, double-ended bulb. It's considered to be the kind of industry standard, if you will. It's a slimline. It's kind of their most advanced HPS um, light. That's going to be compared to their new uh, Gavita CT1930E, which is their LED um, light. You can read all the details there. And as always, a link in the description for all of the sources are provided as well. Now, this is just the general comparison. If you're looking at uh, purchasing both of these, I just went to a website here and just pulled them both up, make sure they were both of the um, same uh, voltage, to 208 to 240 volt. Um, you could see that the HPS light comes in at 237.17 and the um, LED light at $1,516.95. And we both at the same time um, pulled down. So just for a source of comparison. So we'll do that quick grower comparison, you know, more than just the cost comparison. Flower coverage area, the HPS light does a 4x4. Four four. The LED light does a little bit more area, 4x6 is stated. 1,000 watts compared to 780 watts. As a result, the estimated cost of electricity per month to run the HPS would be $43.20 compared to the LED light at $33.70. The warranty is three years on the HPS and five years on the LED. Just to do some quick math, one LED light is the same cost as 6.3 HPS lights. So you could buy 6.3 of these, or just a little over six of these, to one of these lights. And the L But the LED light does have a 20% energy savings, so take that into consideration. Now, five tips for the seamless uh, transition. They mentioned adjusting temperature when growing with LEDs. The VPD, or vapor pressure deficit, as a management tool. Factor in your HVAC as well as your dehumidification. Consider the effects of the lighting spectrum and the light intensity on your chosen crop to grow. And monitor and adjust nutrition and irrigation based on transpiration. And I'll cover all these in detail in this video. So first off, the change in temperature uh, when growing uh, with LED lights. HPS lights produce heat um, in high amounts, as anyone who has used those uh, will know. And it's considered to be a waste or it's radiant heat, but it does help heat the leaf surface. That's important to keep in mind. It does stimulate natural foliage heating, which would occur outside in the sun, though it mimics that type of environment that plants are, are accustomed to. This drives the transpiration of the plant, uh, which is the plant's movement of water or nutrients through the plant. So that's important to consider. LED lights are still giving off some heat. Um, keep that in mind. It's not no heat, but high pressure sodiums definitely have a lot to heat that leaf surface. Now, leaf temperature comparison. So they did some uh, data, and this is pulled from the, the webinar there that they did. Great webinar to check out if you're interested. This graph does uh, quantifies the difference in temperature of the leaf surface under LED lights, as we can see down here, compared to high-pressure sodium lights. Note the same cultivar, uh, black cherry punch, was used, and uh, the plant lighting height was also maintained the same. Also, ambient air temperature, as I tried to highlight down here, was also regulated to be the same in both rooms. 
HPS does produce more infrared, which is at 700 to 850 nanometers, which results in the heating of the leaf surface there. So you can see kind of the average um, here compared to the average here when they had an ambient temperature of 26.5 degrees Celsius. And again, just rough figuring out here, looking at a little over 24 degrees Celsius. And here, kind of the rough middle, maybe just a little bit uh, below 28 degrees Celsius for the leaf temperature. Now, LED lights, they can shift the room temperature. So growers should uh, get an infrared temperature sensor, as we can see right here, uh, to know what their current leaf temperatures are. It's a great way to do a little spot check um, and it allows you to get really quick readings. You want to take random samples as the plants are growing and record those results. This data uh, for the grower can be used to adjust the ambient temperature of the growing environment after they go through and install LED lights to match the previous plant conditions. So if you're growing under um, high intensity discharge, it's a high pressure sodium lights, take some readings as the plants are actively growing, document those readings because you might be needing to adjust your growing room conditions to match those. This also, this temperature does impact the VPD or vapor pressure deficit that growers want to be considering, considering to help manage their growing rooms. So again, it's an important consideration that's often not um, discussed or talked about, the changing of the room temperature that might need to be needed when making the switch to LED lights. So how do we use VPD? Well, I have a video on that, uh, not to be self-promoting, but it goes that into more detail. But the basics is that air can only hold a certain amount of water vapor at a given temperature before it starts to condense back into a liquid form, forms such as um, dew or rain if we're used to being uh, seeing outside in the morning. As the air gets hotter, the amount of water that the air can hold does increase. But as the air cools down, um, the air cannot hold as much water vapor. And that's kind of what reaches kind of this graph here. And that's why there's dew over everything and the, after a cool morning, the air just is too full of water and the water condenses out of that air. This is kind of just a quick little um, comparison here of temperature and relative humidity. And kind of the green zone here would be kind of where you want to keep your plants in. So if you're looking at the change in temperature, again, it's in Fahrenheit from 50 degrees to 113, tells you the relative humidity humidity you need to be at as well and kind of gives you an idea of the ranges here of where to keep your plants ideally happy and transpiring at an adequate rate. So a general summary of vapor pressure uh, deficit um, and key points is that it's mostly about transpiration, which is the movement of that water through the plants. Plants transpire significantly less at night, so keep that in mind. Use a uh, night period uh, for preventing disease by keeping humidity and air temps typically lower. Try to minimize VPD fluctuations uh, for the measurement that's used, less than 0.4 kilopascals. VPD still matters for respiration at night, so keep that in mind. Daytime VPD is about 10 times more important than nighttime VPD. So if you're going to focus on one area, focus on the daytime. Optimum VPD can increase yields as much as uh, as much as CO2 enrichment um, can. So we don't want to be restricting our plants in any way. This is just another way to help maximizing that, looking at relative humidity and temperature to maximize our growing space. And again, the summary, although VPD at night is not nearly as important as your daytime, it's still an important factor to consider for vigorous plant growth and increased yields, and something that could be holding you back even in your current setup. So when we talk about adjusting things, adjusting the HVAC and consider, and consider dehumidification when using LED lights. So again, as a reminder, LED lights still produce heat. LEDs just produce more light per watt than an HPS setup. So you get the same amount of light, but it takes less heat to produce that. Often this reduction in heat from the lights, but this will increase but with an increase in room temperature, there can be less demand on the HVAC system. This can result in a compensation with a dehumidifier. So the light fixtures may be a one-to-one -one change from LED to HPS, but there may be more supplemental equipment such as a dehumidifier that is needed to help maintain uh, equal growing conditions. So this is an important consideration that just because you're switching out um, one light for another, you may also need to bring in another piece of equipment to help maintain that room environment from a plant standpoint related to VPD. Now when we're looking at our lights, as I said, heat sinks are uh, really critical. The goal is to pull heat away from the actual LED lights to reduce the degradation of the diodes. The heat sinks on the back of the fixture further help this process. You're kind of removing those, that heat that way. 
Rail design LEDs have less of an issue compared to this compact form of LED um, style that allows for an easier transition from HBS style um, of lighting. Keep in mind if you're looking at other um, lights, you want to avoid ones that have fans because tend to, the fans tend to fail more than um, the LED light structures and you could get to overheating that way. This is a passive heat sink technology which is really great at prolonging the life of the LED um, lighting fixture. So how we're looking at impacts of light spectra and intensity. So the BPFD or photosynthetic photon flux density is measured in micromoles per square meter per second. This is the long unit, which establishes exactly how many um, par photons, and that's in the photosynthetic spectrum, are landing in a specific area. You wanna measure the, uh, and this is a measure of light intensity taken at canopy level as the plants were growing, as we can see here, time and days after transplant, and LED lights are providing a more intense light at the canopy level. This result uh, can result in an increase in potential uh, yield. So we're looking at our comparison with LED lights in the kind of the circles up here, and then the HPS lights in the red circles uh, down here. We can see that there's a consistent separation with a little bit more light intensity produced with the LED lights compared to the HPS lights. Now when we're looking at the room layout, uh, essentially a one-to-one -one conversion of the fixtures in the physical space of the grow room. So we do a quick comparison of HPS and LED light, and they did an average PPFD and uniformity compared to the two rooms. Note that the average PPFD and uniformity are nearly the same when you compare the two, with a slight edge to uh, PPFD for LED lights as well as uniformity, but it is only slight. In contrast to the previous graph, it's, this is likely due to the natural degradation of the HPS bulbs. So if you've got brand new HPS bulbs compared to LEDs, you might see a more similar. If we're looking at the one just going back for a second here, looking at some of these, these HPS lights could be a little bit older. That's why you could be seeing more of a uh, reduction in the light intensity there compared to the information that was uh, gathered here and presented comparing these two rooms. Now light distribution. So similar light distribution of LED and HPS lights, this helps them to be a one-to-one -one, um, kind of transition. And we could see the HPS lights and the LED lights, you know, very similar um, light spread pattern compared to just the raw LED diode. That spreading of that light allows for um, a more even distribution into the plant canopy. Kind of how does this look from a plant standpoint? Well, this is a nice kind of PPFD map. We're looking at our HPS lights and our LED lights. That widespread optics of the LED with proper design layout allow for an even distribution of the light. We could see that right here in the lower LED ones. This offers a cross room look, kind of looking kind of sideways um, to give you that idea where that spread is. We could see that there is a slight benefit there to the LED lights creating that more of that even spread across uh, the plant canopy. So another advantage there uh, to the LED lights. Now, light spectrum comparisons, LEDs do have more blue than HPSs. We can see this here, this peak here is for the um, LED light, and we can see the HPS light here in the darker uh, black shading. Blue light can uh, induce stomata opening, which can increase the uh, evapotranspiration and the humidity in the grow room. This is part of the reason why that dehumidifier might be a needed component to your growing environment. Differences may be slight in reduced internode spacing with blue light spectrum. It is cultivar dependent, and it can also potentially increase cannabinoid uh, levels as well, but not necessarily to a great degree because you're getting a mixed spectrum. It's not just uh, blue light, but there's some research that does indicate that. Now, light intensity, when we're looking at our light intensity, since LEDs do emit less radiant heat than HPS, Cultivators can increase the PPFD, or the amount of plant usable light measured in photons, to higher levels than recommended when using HPS. This can be especially advantageous when carbon dioxide supplementation is being utilized in a grow room. And we can see that right here where you're looking at running at 400, which is ambient air, to 800 to 1400, how much more light intensity the plants can handle. And there's some recommendations there. And again, investing in a PAR meter would be um, advised there. Uh, so you exactly know how much intensity of light your plants are getting. So data driven changes to nutrient and irrigation based on this uh, transpiration. So you want to know what the baseline is for your current system, as is what you'll be adjusting to basically match. It's a common misconception that switching from HPS to LED lights automatically trigger a need for increased nutrient and irrigation levels. 
Under ideal conditions, higher PPFDs levels do generally lead to faster growth and lead to an increased need for nutrients and water, but it's best to know what you're currently using so you use that as a base of comparison. This is where your grow journals are very important. However, nutrient needs increase because growers do not adjust the other room parameters like ambient temperature, VPD, and dehumidification, not strictly because of higher uh, PPFD levels. So there's other factors that can drive that need for plants, nutrients, and water consumption to be changed. Now, this uh, Gavita did produce this kind of um, LED cultivation set points. Again, this is just their recommendations. I figured I'd include that here. We're looking at um, mother plants compared to propagation, vegetative flower, and a flush week, with the photo period, with the light intensity, the CO2 day and night, the day and nighttime temperature, as well as relative humidity and leaching fraction. So a good baseline to see what your own data is and just compare it to here. Again, they offered it, so I posted it here for you. Now, is there a true cost savings? Well, it, this can be harder to determine as there's often rebates, which are great, but often vary across the region and are not always the same. So that kind of offers a little bit of a degree of variability, if you will. Fixture upfront cost and changes to the HVAC system need to be taken into consideration in addition to the energy consumption to run the lights. So here's our HPS, here's our LED and a proper LED system. You can see that there's some additional equipment that's added um, to keep that growing room happy. So again, that's something that needs that growers need to be advised that switching out the lights is great, but there may be other environmental changes that they may not have those types of equipment if they're currently running HPS lights. Okay, so here's what you've all been waiting for, my grower suggestions. Uh, looking at all this data, here's what I can offer to you as growers. Going to LED light, lighting needs to be a complete room commitment uh, by the grower. Changing out failed HPS lights to LED, despite there being a one-to-one -one coverage area comparison, is not advised due to the different plant environmental impacts. Currently, HPS is overall a little more cost-effective option since you get more than six HPS lights for the cost of a single LED light fixture. But this cost difference can buy a lot of electricity and bulbs. So right now, I'm not sure if it's worth that one-to-one -one comparison. As you saw earlier, that big dollar amount for the fixtures, in addition to potential room changes, the difference may not be justifiable, at least right now. So lighting going forward. So LED technology is a technology of the future and is currently available, but is cost prohibitive for many. As with any technology, there will be improvements and also reduced costs going forward. For example, an improvement that could be made could be those customizable plant spectrums and hopefully the research to back it up as far as maximizing plant productivity. Once the cost of initial purchase drops, it'll make it an easier switch for growers to make. As you have seen, it's more than just simply changing out the fixtures, which hopefully a lot of growers are hoping to be that easy, but there is other factors to consider. So it may be worth uh, the wait a little bit longer. Uh, if you currently have an HPS setup and it's working well for you, might be able to hold on to that setup for a little bit longer, be aware of the technology. Um, and if you are making the change over to LED lights, hopefully this video, as well as other research you do, allows you to make an informed decision so you can take one successful operation and go right into another successful operation knowing what you're getting into.